say that again. Jesus is risen. And you say, come on. That's a powerful exchange right there. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, would you open them up? And I want us to see, I want us to look at a couple of scriptures this morning. Uh, we're going to start in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And I want to put your eye, I want you to put your eyes on some things this morning. You know, this has been a great week. We were able to celebrate last Sunday, Palm Sunday. We talked about Jesus' triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem. We talked about palm branches and what that meant. And then Good Friday, we commemorate on Good Friday his crucifixion. His crucifixion. You know, Jesus was betrayed in the middle of the night. Judas came and, and they took him to uh, Caiaphas' house, Caiaphas' house. And, and this was somewhere between approximate times, between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. And by 9 a.m. that morning, he was being nailed to a cross. And he was crucified right at about 9 a.m. At about noon, because it says in Mark 15, verse 25, it talks about 9 a.m. being the third hour, the sixth hour, which was noon, darkness descended over the earth. And Jesus is on the cross. There's a great earthquake. The <coughs> curtain in the temple that separates the holy place from the holy of holies is ripped in two which signifies that it no longer has to be just one priest one time a year that could come into the Holy of Holies. God is saying all are welcome yes. to come. Those of us that will, that will accept him, receive him as our Lord and Savior, right? And then at 3 p.m., this is where we pick up in John 19. Look at verse 30. I just want us to focus on three words in this scripture that Jesus said. And those three words, as you can tell, they're in parentheses, it is finished. It is finished. Jesus didn't say it is to be continued. He didn't say, hey, there's more to do. He didn't say the price was mostly paid for you. He said it is finished. It is finished means that the project is over and the tools are put away. Yeah. It means it's over. Yeah. There's nothing else that can be done. It means everything that Jesus was going to do for you, he already did. Because he provided everything that you have need of. Everything that you and I would ever need in our life, he paid for. Imagine that. You know, I think about, I, as, as um, Dave was talking I couldn't help but think about Philippians 4.19. I love that scripture because it set me free financially. I, I had a breakfast with a local pastor recently this, this last week, and he was asking me about finances and how do you budget at the church and how do you guys kind of figure out your finances? And, and, and I could tell he was really concerned about paying bills. And I said, man, let me give you a scripture that set me free because Jesus finished the work. It is finished. He finished the work. Philippians 4.19, that whole chapter talks about finances. Paul said, hey, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content when I have a lot, and I've learned to be content when I don't have a lot, when I have little. But he, in, this scripture, Philippians 4.19, is so powerful because he says, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not according to your ability to bring it in. And it really set me free from anxiety, from fear, from worry, from concern. Because I know personally that if I'm keeping covenant and I'm a tither and I'm doing what the Lord told me to do. And I told this pastor, I said, that's the first question you have to get answered is, am I doing what God told me to do? Am I in his will? Am I living in covenant to the word of God. And if I'm not, it's real easy to get right back in covenant. I can ask the Lord to forgive me and I can get right into covenant. And then guess what? All of my needs are met according to his riches and glory, not according to my ability to be a great fundraiser. Not according to my ability to get you guys to commit to a certain amount a year so I can know what our budget's gonna be. 
Because I'm not looking to people, I'm looking to God. Too often we're looking to other things other than God when he finished the work. Man, that's good preaching right there, Pastor Phil. Yeah, it wasn't even a part of my message. Now turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Thank you, Dave, for being so transparent. I love Dave and Ellen. We just are so thankful for them. And Ellen's in children's church teaching, having a great time. She's teaching about the resurrection. The kid and Alicia, yeah. And those kids, they get Easter baskets today. You guys don't get one. Because you're in here. You'll have to go buy your own. All right, John chapter 10, verse 10. This to me is my personal favorite verse when it comes to describing good and bad describing the enemy and describing God because Jesus said this he said in verse 10 the thief does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy those are the three reasons that he comes he doesn't come to bargain with you he doesn't come to be your pal be your buddy it's not going to be a big party in hell it's going to be horrific right so he comes to steal kill and destroy he said but I have come this is Jesus talking I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That's not just surviving, that's thriving. Yes, yeah. That's not just getting by, that's all of my needs met and extra so that I can bless other people. All right, I just paused for effect, that's what I was doing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I want to get into some things this morning because I wanted you to understand the character of God be before we begin to get into some of the things that have to do with Easter and resurrection. <clears throat> because in the Old Testament, God required that the Israelites would bring sacrifices, offerings to him. The ones that he required required that blood be shed so why is that I want to talk for a moment about that because this is this is important for us to talk about because each one of these offerings required blood because we're celebrating Easter today and I think it's important for us to understand the significance of Jesus sacrifice in the garden of Eden Adam and Eve got to fellowship with God face to face every day they walked in the garden. It says that God came down and he walked in the garden with them every day in the cool of the day. That would be really neat. And so they had face-to-face -face contact. Well, when sin happened, when Adam and Eve sinned and they disobeyed God, that fellowship could no longer happen. Why? Because God is holy. He can't be where sin is because light expels darkness. Darkness can't be in the presence of light. That's how you can be in that, in that room trying to sleep and you're charging something and that little light is on in the corner. It's illuminating the whole room. It illuminates the whole room. Light expels darkness. Holiness expels sin. And so they could no longer have that fellowship. And so God, when he delivered the Israelites from Egypt, he brought them out and he said, I'm gonna bring you to the mountain. And he descends on the mountain in a dark cloud what happened at the crucifixion at noon darkness a dark cloud you remember Jesus said my God my God why have you forsaken me God didn't forsake him but God had to turn his face darkness of the cloud on Sinai concealed the glory of God because the children of Israel couldn't have experienced the glory of God and lived something to chew on there and so as we celebrate Easter why would God send his son God wants fellowship again with his children he wants to walk with you in the garden well Phil I don't know if you've looked around at the earth it's under a curse no everything that you touch in your house can be a garden of Eden yeah so Hebrews chapter 10 I want to read something to you about Jesus coming. Hebrews chapter 10, verse five says this. It says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And in other words, you've prepared me, Jesus here, to do your will. 
So the animal sacrifice, when God looked at the animal sacrifices that were happening in the Old Testament before Jesus went to the cross, he's not seeing the blood of that animal. What he's seeing is Jesus shed blood on the cross because Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. We see that over in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for, for you. That was in the New King James Version. Let me read it to you out of the NLT, New Living Translation. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. So where was that revealed? It was in the heart of God himself. Okay, so when God spoke, it happened, time later revealed it. So don't get frustrated when you speak good things over your children and you haven't seen it yet. Time will reveal it. That's what faith is. Faith is believing God, trusting him, speaking what he says, and then watching it come to pass. My daughter, Becca, when she came into the fifth grade, she goes, she was really struggling. And it was the beginning of the school year, and I used to put her to bed at night. And uh, anyway, I was putting her to bed, and, and she just seemed a little discouraged about school. And I said, what's going on? And she said, Dad, the, the school is a lot harder than it was in the fourth grade. You know, it bumped up a level. And so she needed to, you know, step up with the curriculum. And uh, anyway, she said, I'm really struggling, Dad. And I looked at her and I said, Becca, you are so smart. I said, you understand concepts easily. I mean, you, schoolwork comes easy to you because God has given you the mind of Christ. And I began to speak over her what I wanted to see. Time later revealed it because you know what happened? She began to do a li little better, a little better. It got easier, it got easier, it got easier. Yeah, and so it works. So when God, so let me get back. So when God saw the blood of the animals, what is he seeing? He's seeing the shed blood of his son, Jesus. So why was blood required? Leviticus chapter 17 tells us the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood, blood, so that when God created Adam and it says that he breathed life into Adam, when he breathed, blood began to circulate. It began to flow through his veins because the life for the body is in the blood. Okay, so remember that, the blood, the breath of God, the blood is the life of God. So why is the blood required? Let me put it this way, because God is holy. Now, we don't have, because of our nature, it's not our fault. Look at your neighbor say, it's not your fault. Especially if they're your spouse. It's not your fault. <laughs> Especially if he's your husband. It's not your fault. No. <laughs> the reason I'm having you say that is because we were born into sin. We didn't get a choice. We didn't get a choice. We were born in sin. We were conceived in sin. And so we, we were born in it. We were raised in darkness. And God is light. He is light. And light has no darkness in it. And so this is the message of the gospel. You and I are born in darkness. We're conceived in sin, right? God is holy. It's not an attribute, just an attribute of God. It's not just a characteristic of God. It's his very nature, holiness. So he's that light, right? And so when we say, God, you are holy, we are declaring the absolute nature of God. Think about it. In heaven right now, they're worshiping God. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come. All right. So because he's holy, darkness has no place in his presence. So sin has no place in his presence. It's the way that light drives out darkness, his holiness drives out sin. It can't live in his presence. So, so <clears throat> let me say it this way. God's presence is both life-giving, but it can be death-giving as well. All right. So what's the answer? God loves us so much. 
that he had a plan. He knows the end from the beginning. He had the plan. It's spelled out in Genesis. You can go back and read it. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, and as soon as they pointed fingers at each other, Adam pointed fingers at Eve, Eve pointed fingers at the serpent, God came down and spoke to all three of them, and he, and he, are, and he shared the gospel plan right there in the garden. He had a plan right there. So think about this. God told the Israelites, they're making sacrifices. He told them, he said, because my covenant is with you, I will not eliminate you from, from my presence, but I will require the elimination of a life. And that's the sacrifice. So the priest would sacrifice, you know, the lamb, the goat, whatever, whatever the appropriate sacrifice was. And then he would dip his hand in the blood and he would splatter it against the altar seven times. Prophetically revealing the seven times that Jesus would bleed for you and I. What is Jesus called? He's called the Lamb of God. Why? Because he's the sacrifice. It says in Revelation, remember no one was able to open the book, but here came a lamb that looked like he had been slain from, the found, from before the foundation of the world, and he was able to open the book. Why? Because he's the lamb that was slain for you and I. He was the sacrifice. And so he bled seven times. The first time he bled was in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Judas betrayed him on Thursday night, right? And, and here he is in the garden. They've left, the la they've left supper together. They sang a hymn. They went out to the garden. Jesus begins to really have a heavy heart. Why? He knows what's coming. He knows the price that he's about to pay. And so he begins to pray. And it says that his prayer, that his blood became like drops of blood. Let's read it. It's over in Luke 22. I'm going to read it out starting in verse 42. Jesus began to pray saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that's the best prayer that we can ever pray is that God's will would be done in our life. Amen. And then verse 43, then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him because his di disciples were asleep and couldn't strengthen him. And so here comes, no, I'm teasing, but it's true, they were asleep. And in verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Illustrated Bible Dictionary dictionary. Um, defines agony as a struggle with evil at the present time, right now, currently. So he was struggling with that. And so the interesting thing is, now I'm not a medical, I know very little about medicine. Okay, when I get a prescription filled, I never try to say what the name of the medicine is. Just, it's, here's my birthday. Okay, so, so I, I'm not going to try and pronounce this word, but it's a condition that occurs under conditions of extreme physical and emotional stress when your sweat can turn into drops of blood. So it's an actual condition. First place he, he bled, Garden of Gethsemane. Second place he bled, the house of Caiaphas. Let's look at that over in Matthew 26. It says this, that then they spat in his face and they beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying prophesy to us Christ who is the one who struck you so this is this is at Caiaphas house the high priest and then in Isaiah 50 verse 6 listen to this it says describing this incident in verse 6 I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard little literally ripped out his beard and I did not hide my face from shame or spitting. That's the second place. The third place he bled before Pilate. He was brought before Pilate. Pilate, you remember, he wanted, he didn't feel that Jesus had done anything worthy of death. You remember that, right? He didn't, and so he tried to get him released. So one of his strategies was, I, if, I, if we scourge him, then possibly the Jews will just let me release him because he hasn't done anything worthy of death. Only the Romans were brutal. 
They were brutal. Listen to what it says in the NLT in John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with lead tipped, with a lead tipped whip. I think Passion of the Christ really displays this so well. You know, where the bone, metal, or stone that was tied at the end of that whip would sink in the skin and then basically shred it. And this is really interesting. Zach was sharing this with me um, just recently. The World Health Organization decides every year they categorize, they take every known disease and they categorize them. So they came up with all the categories. Guess how many categories there were? 39. Guess how many stripes Jesus took on his back? By his stripes, we are healed. Amen. Fourth place was the crown of thorns. It says in that same chapter, John 19, verse 2, that the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put it on him. They put a purple robe on him, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Fifth place was Golgotha. So Jesus carries the cross with the help of Simon of Cyrene, helps carry, him, carry his cross down the Via Della Rosa, and they come to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. I've actually seen a, a, an old picture because now that place where, where they believe Golgotha was is a bus parking lot, and there's a hill in the background. And the old picture that you can see, you can actually see a skull in the side of the hill. You can make out a skull, place of the skull, where Jesus was crucified. So this fifth place was when they nailed his hands, this, that fifth time. The sixth time was when they nailed his feet. The seventh time was when they put a spear in his side, and he bled. So I want to read this. This is a very interesting scripture. Isaiah, God used him just tremendously, and he prophesied this. Listen to this scripture and tell me what you think. In light of the priests that would take the blood and would splatter it seven times against the altar. It says this in chapter 52, verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Hmm. So just as the priest took the blood and sprinkled it against the altar, Jesus took his blood and sprinkled it against the nations. Uh, are you guys getting this? Okay. All right, so the sprinkling of the blood. Why did he become flesh? I want to read to you now Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. And this is out of the J.B. Phillips translation. It's very interesting how this reads. In verse 5, it says this, Let Christ himself be our example as to what your attitude should be. For he who had always been God by nature did not cling to his prerogatives as God's equal but stripped himself of all privilege by consenting to be a slave by nature and being born as mortal man. And having become man, he humbled himself by living a life of utter obedience, even to the extent of dying. And the death he died was the death of a common criminal. That is why God has now lifted him so high and has given him the name beyond all names, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, whether in heaven or earth or under the earth. And that is why, <clears throat> by the way, under the earth is hell. Yeah. Hell is in the center of the earth. Okay, just so you know. And that is why, in the end, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God, the Father. Now, I want you to go over to Psalm 22. And uh, Rebecca, I'm going to ask you to help. <clears throat> nice Easter outfit, Rebecca. Everybody looks nice today, by the way. Mm -hmm. 
Psalm 22. <clears throat> I think it's so interesting that one of the first things that Jesus said on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the last thing that we see that he said recorded in scripture is what we read to begin, which is, it is finished. Because this, these are the bookends to Psalm 22. Now, let's read some of Psalm 22 together. In the fir very first verse, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, some people think that this is David talking about his woes. Can you forgive me for a minute? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> verse six. Let's jump to verse six. So he starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now this reveals to us who he's talking about. In verse six, it says, but I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip and shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now, you don't have to turn over there, but I wanna to read to you Matthew 27, verse 43, because this is the religious leaders. Listen to what they're saying. He trusted in God, let him deliver now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Does that sound familiar? This is David prophesying, saying this. Then in verse 12, he goes on to say, many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls from Bashan have encircled me. They grope at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax and it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue clings to my jaws. Another verse says, my tongue clings to the roof of my mouth. This is very interesting because when one of the symptoms of significant blood loss is extreme thirst. Remember Jesus said, I am thirsty on the cross, I thirst. Why did he say that? He had literally poured out his blood for us through the flogging, through the whipping, through the nails in his hands, in his feet, it's pouring out. And so he's thirsty, okay. Then verse 16, it says, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Then in verse 30, a posterity shall serve him. It shall be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. That's us. And they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. The, Amer the Amplified Version says it is finished. The work is done. The work is completed. Guys, this is the greatest news for any individual. The greatest news is that we have been forgiven, that Jesus paid the price so that we didn't have to. He died for it so that we didn't have to die from it. He provided salvation. He provided a way for you and I to not only be forgiven for everything that we've ever done in the past, but a way for us to come to him and to confess our sin and he would be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because the Bible says all have sinned, all, and fallen short of what? Of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I, I, I desire the glory of God to be manifest in my life. And see in him, by the help of the Holy Spirit, he empowers us to live free from sin, from the bondage of sin. 
We don't have to live a life that, is, that we get kicked around, that we have to live in guilt and shame and condemnation. No, I've been forgiven. And so now Romans 8, 1 is mine. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Oh man, oh. And so Jesus had to come. That was the plan. He had to come as a man, which was why I read that Phillips translation, was so that we could understand the man part was very important. Are you, Phil, are you saying he wasn't God? No, I'm saying he was God with us, but he had to take on human flesh. Otherwise, how could he say, I was tempted like in every manner as you are? Every way that you've been tempted, God has been tempted. Jesus has been tempted. He knows what it's like to experience what you've experienced, but he to a much greater degree because he came to lay his life down, literally. See, you and I are gonna get a glorified body one day. It's gonna, you're gonna be looking good. I mean, you're looking good now, but I mean, you know, think about that. That's gonna be amazing. No more aches, pains. Get your hair back, get your muscles back. Things shift in your body. It's gonna be amazing, right? Jesus, when he was resurrected, his spirit wasn't resurrected. It was still alive. His spirit and his soul were still alive. He went to the heart of the earth for you and I. We just know the story of the crucifixion. But when he died, when he left his physical body, when his physical body died, because his spirit didn't, he went to the center of the earth. The Bible says he led captivity captive. Mm, man. And when he was resurrected, guess what was resurrected? His body is resurrected. But I love this, the blood is no longer in there. How do you have holes in your hands and feet and your side and blood not come out? Because the life is in the spirit. You and I have this physical blood and one day we're gonna step out of this thing. And so when you get ready to step out into eternity, are you gonna be able to say it is finished? That you finished strong? Or are you hoping that God will be merciful when he's a just judge? Because when we step out of this body, it's too late. But you have this moment here, now. We're not promised the next moment. We're only promised the one we're in. We're living this right now, so it must have been promised to us. And I don't want anybody to check out <laughs> right now. This is not a good time. But I'm just saying that God wants us. He wanted to provide this opportunity for us. So I, so I can't live and hold on to sin over here and drag that into heaven with me and expect him to be merciful on this side. No, he said to, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? That means flesh gets to die. Do you know what deny yourself means? Let me, let me put it very simply. There's a bowl of M&Ms and there's an apple. And you're trying, you want to eat healthy, right? And so you say, okay, not eating the M&Ms. And you grab the apple. You might not be happy about it, right? But you eat the apple, right? What is that? That's denying self because self wants the M&Ms. I'm just trying to put it simply. That's me, I don't know about you, but I want the M&Ms, but I'm going to the fridge and getting an apple because I want to make a better choice. No, I'm just saying this is denying self. And then what happens? See, we can't come to the cross and do what they did in the Old Testament and just keep repeatedly making sacrifices, making sacrifices, making, why can't you do that? Because he already made the sacrifice. He is risen. He already 
paid the price. He became the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, I have to receive him, but if I receive him and I choose to continue in sin, there's no longer a sacrifice. Thank you, Steve. Steve, help me preach. There's no longer a sacrifice. Why? Because I'm continuing in sin. But I'm telling you, today is our day. This is your day to let go of this and to take up your cross and follow him. Live free. Live free. Don't gamble. You don't want to step into to eternity with a maybe. Mm-mm. We want to step into eternity knowing him. So would you bow your heads, close your eyes all